It's day 109 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. My name is Kanoi. Welcome to Bible Study. If you're new here, please let us know where you're watching from, what part of the world you're in. Oh, geez, give me a shout out. And otherwise, we are finishing up the book of 1 Samuel today. And then we are hitting up the fourth longest psalm in the Bible. Otherwise, if you could help us out by giving this video a thumbs up, also making sure you're subscribed, hit that notification bell so you know when the Bible studies drop because they're always at different times every single day. And if you want to draw closer to this community, make sure you join our Facebook group, all the info in the description box below. So our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. So starting here in chapter 28, David is still in Gath, which is Philistine territory. And he is going to be faced with quite the decision here. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. Of course, David's people. And Achish said to David, understand that you and your men are going to fight with me in the army. Why did he tell him that? Because 600 of the men with David are Israelites. David said to Achish, very well, you shall know what your servant can do. So he didn't quite answer this. He was using some ambiguous words here by not really saying, yeah, I'm going to fight with you. But he's saying, you know what I can do. And Achish said to David, very well, I'll make you my bodyguard for life. So I wrote here, every temptation that the devil sends which in this case was temporary respite from Saul by David fleeing to Philistine territory, comes gift wrapped as a present. So that respite is a present, but it's actually a temptation. And here he's going to be faced with that temptation. So there's always a price to pay. David is now receiving the invoice for what he has done here by fleeing to Philistine land. Now Samuel has died. And all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. The reason why they, uh, I'm trying to remember why they wrote that here. Clearly we know Samuel died already and it was already spoken, but maybe it was just for the sake of being able to show that Saul no longer has any sort of mentor. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. So I was like, gold star, Saul. At least you did something right. <laughs> the Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem. And Saul gathered all of Israel and they encamped at Gilboa. So here we're going to see Saul's final act of disobedience. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. Saul is so fearful here. One, because the spirit of the Lord is no longer with him. So he has zero courage left. But two, because the Philistines have come all the way down to Gilboa, which is the northern city in Israel. They are now coming deep into their territory. So Saul is fearful here and he's boxed in. But this is his own fault because he has been fighting the wrong battle the entire time. He was so concerned about David this whole time that he failed to prepare for the real war. This is why it is so important that we can't be fighting the petty battles that the enemy wants us to fight because he knows that if he can keep us over here worried about these people like little cockroaches and mosquito bites, then we are not going to be preparing for the real spiritual battle that will be on this side. So we've got to be able to identify which battles are the ones we are truly to fight. Verse six, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or Urim or by prophets. And Saul said to his servants, seek out for me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her, inquire of her. And his servant said to him, behold, there is a medium at Endor. So she was originally known as the witch of Endor. Uh, the Hebrew word for medium is aub. And that means uh, anybody who consults with the dead. That's what a medium is. So Saul's fear which is spoken here, is the result of his disobedience. He no longer trusts in the presence and the protection of the Lord. He didn't obey what he already knew, so God is no longer speaking to him anymore. And now he is in the battle of a lifetime uh, as he turns to this psychic or this medium. This is going to open the door for demonic deception. And it's also going to curse him because it says in Leviticus 20 verse 6, for those who consult mediums, the Lord says, I will set my face against them and cut him off from his people. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went. 
probably because he doesn't want other people to see that he's going to a medium and he doesn't want to reveal his identity to her. He and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night and he said, divine for me, a spirit and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. And the woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for my life to bring about my death? So she's like, hello, this is against the law. I'm not about to put my life on the line. But Saul swore to her by the Lord. That's interesting because he denies the sovereignty of God over his life, yet he still speaks the words. He still swears by his name. And that just goes to show that people who speak spiritual jargon doesn't mean that they are godly people. Uh, Jargon means nothing without the actions to prove it. So he said, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. Okay, wait, why is this woman so freaked out? Probably because she was a fraud. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that movie Ghost when Whoopi Goldberg actually sees a spirit for the first time and she does the same thing. Ah! She freaks out. Because if she had been dealing with only demonic spirits this whole time, now that she sees an actual godly spirit, it is something that is not familiar to her. Or perhaps she actually wasn't a medium after all, and she's freaking out that for the first time, she's actually seeing a spirit. And the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. And the king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. And he said to her, what is his appearance? And she said, an old man is coming up and he's wrapped in a robe. This is probably the robe that Saul or Samuel wore whenever Saul tore it, when he was trying to cling on to the kingdom, when Samuel told him it was going to be stripped out of his hands. And Saul knew that it was Samuel and he bowed down with his face to the ground and he paid homage. So was this actually Samuel? Scholars have been in debate over this. Some say that it was a hallucination. Some say that it was deception by the medium because she was a fraud in the first place. So she's making this up. Some think that it might have might have been a demonic impersonation of Samuel. But most schools of thought believe that genuine, uh, this was a genuine appearance of Samuel, but strange perhaps. And maybe it was a chance for Saul to perhaps repent for the final time. So Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? (laughs) So this goes to show that there is a reality of the afterlife. Samuel has been resting peacefully. He's been in what is called Abraham's bosom uh, until they're raised up out of the earth whenever Jesus died on the cross. So he's happy here. He's like, I don't want to come back to this earth to you crazy people. And Saul answered, I'm in great distress for the Philistines are warring against me and God has turned away from me. No, he hasn't. You turned away from God, but that's neither here nor there and answers me no more either by the prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you to tell me what I shall do. And Samuel said, why then do you ask me since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? So he's like, if God isn't speaking to you, what makes you think that I'm going to have a word for you? The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David, because you didn't obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. So he's like, you didn't listen to what God told you in the first place. So he's not going to tell you anymore. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. And then the Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. So what is going on here? Well, Saul thought that perhaps time might have changed God's mind. We know that time never changes God's mind. Perhaps repentance, a broken heart, brokenness might have changed God's mind. But he didn't do that. Saul never came with a humble heart and genuine repentance. And then let's look at here uh, when he tells him, you guys are going to be with me. We've got to make the distinction about Abraham's bosom, which is a place of comfort for those who believed. But there was also a place of torment spoken of for those who did not believe. And we know that these are in the same area. They're not in the same specific places, but perhaps they're in the same area. So we honestly don't know, or at least I don't at this point, where Saul ends up going. 
Uh, if he's unbelieving, I'm kind of guessing that it might be in this place of torment. I don't know. But just know that there's two different places. So when Samuel said, you'll be with me, that doesn't necessarily mean he, you're going to be with me in this good place. So I just wanted to bring clarity to that because some people may automatically think that he's, you know, going to a good place and going to heaven later. Okay, where are we? Um, verse 20, then Saul fell at once full length on the ground, filled with fear because of the words of Samuel. So <laughs> going to consult this medium did nothing good for him. It actually probably put him in a worse space because now he knows he's going to die the next day and he's got to spend the next 24 hours worrying about this. So basically Samuel told him, you know what? The Philistines and the gods are, uh, God are against you. And this was basically more than he could bear. It's why he fell down. And there was no strength in him for he had eaten nothing all day and all night. And the woman came to Saul. And when she saw that he was terrified, she said to him, behold, your servant has obeyed you. I have taken my life in my hand and I've listened to what you have said to me. Now, therefore, you also obey your servant. Let me set a morsel of bread before you and eat that you may have strength when you go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his servants together with the woman urged him and he listened to their words. So this is going to be his final meal that he has on earth. And of course, the woman is being very hospitable to him because at this point she knows that he's the king. So he arose from the earth and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fattened calf in the house and she quickly killed it and she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread of it. And she put it before Saul and his servants and they ate. Then they rose and went away that night. So did the medium actually have control over Samuel's spirit or was this actually God? Because what this is doing, we're seeing God's purpose in this, is that it's not only reconfirming the judgment on Saul, but it perhaps was also teaching this medium a lesson about the danger of her practice. And then the third thing is that it is a rebuke for Saul. So whatever the answer is, at least we know that, of course, God has a purpose or he will use it for good. Chapter 29, so now they are poised to fight Israel, the Philistines. Now the Philistines had gathered all their forces at Aphek, and the Israelites were encamped by the spring that was in Jezreel. As the lords of the Philistines were passing by, hundreds and by thousands, and David and his men were passing on in the rear with Achish, the commander of the Philistines said, what are these Hebrews doing here? So they could see what David couldn't. David didn't even notice it. If only David truly remembered who he was and who he actually belonged to. And Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me now for days and years? And since he deserted to me, I have found no fault in him to this day. So they're trying to say he's not a man of God. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him. And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, send the man back that he may return to the place to which you have assigned him. He shall not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become an adversary to us. For how could this fellow reconcile himself to his Lord? Would it not be with the heads of the men here? Is not this David of whom they sing to one another in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And again, if only David could remember that he did this when he had all of that courage. Then Achish called David and said to him, as the Lord lives. So even though Achish may not actually be a man of God, he's saying this, trying to somewhat show some sincerity of his confidence in David. So it's, as the Lord lives, you have been honest. And to me, it seems right that you should march out and in with me in the campaign. For I have found nothing wrong in you from the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, the Lords do not approve of you. So I need you to go back now and go peaceably that you may not displease the Lords of the Philistines. So he's telling him you're not going to fight. I need you to go back. And David said to Achish, but what have I done? What have you found in your servant from the day I entered your service until now that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my Lord, the King? So David is straddling two worlds here. I mean, he is an Israelite by, you know, nature, by heart, but he's actually showing that he might think he wants to go fight his own people. And therefore, he has no peace. He doesn't know which side he belongs to. So it's actually better to be on one side or the other, to be hot or cold, not lukewarm, right? It would have been better for him to be on the Israelite side with too much God and not be at peace with the world. 
but instead he is on both sides and he is in complete anguish, like confused. He doesn't know where he belongs. And Achish answered David and said, I know that you are as blameless in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said he shall not go up with us to battle. Now then rise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord, meaning Saul, who came with you and start early in the morning and depart as soon as you have light. So God is basically stepping in here for David, even though his heart is technically backslidden. It isn't right right now, but God believes in him. He knows the true nature of David's heart. So David set out with his men early in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. And I'm like, wrong way, David. But the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Chapter 30. Now, when David and his men came to Ziklag, which means winding road, on the third day, which is where he's living, him and his 600 soldiers, the Amalekites. Okay, <laughs> flashback. Okay, the Amalekites, remember, this means dweller in the valley. They are nomads and they were always at war with God's people. Uh, remember now that the Amalekites are under a divine judgment as well as spoken in Deuteronomy 25, 19 because of the way that they treated the Israelites when they were on their exodus out of, of Egypt. So the Amalekites had made a raid against Negeb and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but they carried them off and went their way. So they were probably going to keep everyone as slaves. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So here again, we see another example of what happens when you are fighting the wrong battles. David is trying to fight a battle against his own people with the Philistines. And because so, because he was so concerned with this battle, he left his entire village, family, possessions, all unguarded. And because so, his entire town has been burned to the ground and all of his family, his livestock have been captured and are now in the hands of the Amalekites. Verse four, then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, as he should be, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Whew, what a turn of the tides here. Hallelujah. This is where it all begins, where things start to look up once again. And of course, he has no other choice. I mean, the, his people have turned against him. His family is all gone. He has nothing left. He has hit rock bottom here. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. So he did the right thing here. First, he strengthened himself in the Lord. He took it upon himself to get that strength. It's available to all of us, but we've got to be the ones to do something about it. And he did. And then secondly, he goes and he inquires of the Lord. Second thing that he should have done and he did it right. I want to do a heart check here. When we are at our wits end, do we inquire of the Lord of everything that we should do? Today, I took this to heart and I said, you know what? I'm going to start trying to be a person who inquires of the Lord in both big and small things. So I simply asked, Lord, should I get my son an iPhone? Because he broke his iPhone and we we're telling him he's getting a flip phone because it's just too bad. So sad. But I'm like, these are the things, I mean, the menial things that we never think to ask the Lord for, we really should, because you never know what the ramifications could be down the line. And of course, always, but your will be done, right? So do we inquire of the Lord in both big and small things? So David set out and the 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men. So these 400 men, their faith obviously stirred up because of David's faith. 200 stayed behind who were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor. So these, men's are, these men are so exhausted because they have just traveled 80 miles. And I know I had a post-it note on this and I don't know where it went, but they have just tra traveled 80 miles in pursuit of the Philistines. So it's not that they are scared or anything like that, but literally too exhausted. They found an Egyptian. So, okay, sorry. We actually saw that David did the thing. So inquire, no, strengthen, inquire, and do it. 
They found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David, and they gave him bread, and he ate. They gave him water to drink. So they're being very generous here to someone who's probably more like a... Um, an enemy, and they gave him a piece of cake and figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. So he was on the brink of death here, not having any water for three nights as well. And David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. So normally... Um, they would leave sick people behind because it was more expensive to try to treat them than to just go and get themselves another man to replace them or just forego their existence. So he left him behind. And we had made a raid against Negeb of the uh, Kirathites and against that which belongs to Judah and against the Negeb of Caleb. And we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, will you take me down to this band? And he said, swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master and I will take you down to this band. So I just wondered here, the fact that he's an Egyptian and an Amalekite, or at least he's got allegiance to the Amalekite, is he actually a believer in God or is he just like, swear to me by your God because I know how much allegiance you have to him. I don't know. Verse 16, and when he had taken him down, behold, they were spread abroad all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. So they are partying it up here with all of the spoils that they had taken. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day. And not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. Twilight is actually probably more like before dawn. So they fought all day long. And David recovered all, all, not just some of it, that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken, and David brought it all back. David also captured all the flocks and herds, and the people drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. So very different from Saul. Saul was given instructions to destroy the Amalekites completely. David wasn't given those instructions. He was simply told, pursue and they shall, um, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. So he was on a rescue mission here and he was able to do that. And the Lord wants us to be the same way when he sends us out to rise up, to take back what the enemy has stolen. He wants us to take it all back, not just little victories. He wants us to be completely victorious. Then David came to 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow, so the ones who stayed behind, and who had been left at the brook Besor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with them. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David, so those 400 men, <laughs> said, because they didn't go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man let, may lead away his wife and children and depart. So this is pretty much a natural human reaction here. You all didn't fight with us. You ain't getting anything. We're not going to reward you. But David said, you shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. So he is very well aware that this is a gift from God. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that comes against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. So he is going to show that... Even though there are people who stay behind, they are just as important as those who actually go out to battle. And it's the same way that it should be uh, for those of us who are not in leadership positions. Maybe we're not fully on the front lines in worship or on the stage at church, but we are in the, you know, in the back of the house. We are running lights. We are the prayer team. We are supporting the ministry in other ways. Maybe we're just giving our tithes and offerings, whatever it is, whatever you're doing in the the name of ministry, just know that you are just as important to receive the blessing, the reward of the Lord, whether it be here on this earth or later on. Verse 26, when David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, here's a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. 
it was for those in Bethel, in Ramoth, of the Negev, in Jadar, in Aroer, in Sifmoth, in Eshtemoa, in Rakal, in the cities of the Jeremielites, in the cities of the Kenites, in Horma, in Boration, in Athak, in Hebron, for all the places where David and his men had roamed. So he is basically giving them a peace offering. And Hebron, by the way, is um, the place that was captured by Joshua, given to Caleb. It's a Levitical city. This is what becomes David's capital uh, once he sets up his city. So here he is trying to mend relationships here, all the places where he had roamed. This is the final step that David needed to take in getting things right. Chapter 31. Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. So this was kind of sad here. I was like, wait, what? And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchai Shua. So we're seeing three of Saul's sons being struck down here. This is somewhat of an honorable death because they are fighting for their people. And this is used as a part of God's plan, not to say that God struck them down, but they are being struck down. So God is using this for a way to date for David to become king, um, for it to be divinely cleared out. There's not going to be any issues with anybody trying to take their place, take Saul's place as king. Now the battle pressed hard against Saul and the archers found him and he was badly wounded by the archers. So he's pretty much more, you know, he's mortally wounded already. He's going to die. So Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through the through with it. Lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not do it for he feared greatly. Therefore, Saul took his own sword and he fell upon it. So some say that this was just straight up suicide, that he uh, made himself, you know, took his own life. But some say that, no, he was already mortally wounded. So this was just simply speeding up his death. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men on that same day together. So this is that final judgment that we are seeing. But of course it ends with Saul once again, taking it to his own hands instead of allowing the Lord to do what he would do. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and they fled and the Philistines came and lived in them. Then the next day, the Philistines came to strip the slain. They found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. So they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the, quote, good news to the house of their idols and to the people. So they're glorifying their gods while basically mocking the one true God. They put his armor in the temple of Ashtaroth and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. But when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard that what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beth Shan, and they came to Jabesh and burned them there. So burning the bodies here was not a customary thing the way that it is today, but they did this probably because the bodies were so badly mutilated that they needed to. And they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. So this was what would be a typical uh, thing to do during times of mourning. It was their way of showing respect to Saul and his sons. So if you remember uh, Jabesh Gilead 40 years earlier, they actually were rescued by Saul. Um, I believe it was the time when I don't know, it was like 350,000 men or something rose up to go rescue Jabesh Gilead. And he did so because he had compassion on them. And so they're basically kind of returning the favor here. So we can kind of see Jesus or David as a picture of Jesus and all of these aspects being us. For example, David's men, they turned on Jesus. They wanted to stone him. And of course, David you know, continue to do the things that he was doing. We are like the weary men who are like, that's not fair. I want my equal share. But Jesus is still so just and so equitable. Um, we're like the Egyptian slave who are about to die in our sin. And Jesus comes and he feeds us. He restores us. He revives our spirit. We are like the spoil that's recovered, that has been stolen. The enemy has tried to steal 
kill and destroy us. And Jesus comes to save us. Uh, We are like the elders of Judah who perhaps don't deserve any of the gifts or the rewards, but Jesus still comes and lavishes us with them. Psalm 18, this is titled, The Lord is my rock and my fortress. This is the fourth longest psalm in the Bible. It is the Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of the song to the Lord. So that's interesting that this was written for the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And this is going to be sung also in 2 Samuel 22 at the end of his life, even though it was probably penned earlier or it was penned earlier. Okay, there's a lot going on here because not only are these David's words, but it is also prophetic of the coming of Christ, not only the first coming, but also the second coming. So I'm going to try to keep you guys (laughs) on track here. Now, verse one, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. So he has got a flood of praise going on here. He is so grateful. He's got this deep, compassionate love, kind of like a mother loves her child when he says, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. That is one of the first things I say whenever the Lord comes and rescues me. So he is saying all these things. You are all of these things to me. You're my strength because God empowered him to defeat his enemies. He's, he is uh, my rock, meaning he's my shelter, my safety, my security. You're my fortress, my strength, my safety. You're my deliverer. You provided me an escape. You are my God, which is, you can, do, you can already figure out that, that one means strength. You're my fountain. You're my source. You are my origin of where all this comes from. You're my shield, meaning you defend me. You're my horn. You're my strength and my defense and my stronghold or my high tower or my hiding place. Verse four, the cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me and the snares of death confronted me. So David not only has this faith that he once had, but now he's got the experience to back up his faith. He is able to say this with complete confidence now. And here in verse four, we are going to see where his life uh, was endangered. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me and the snares of death confronted me. Now, Jesus also cried out to the Father when he was in distress. This is going to show how human and sensitive the heart of David was. He wasn't just this rah kind of guy who wasn't ever afraid. I mean, he definitely dealt with emotions of being faced with death. Verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Now, the only cry that we know from a sinner that the Lord hears and responds to is a cry of repentance. And now seven through nine, we're going to see a depiction of Jesus on the cross. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. So this is showing the violent wrath of God here. And on the flip side of the meaning of the coming of Jesus or of Jesus's life. This says that God will tear up creation. He will turn the world upside down if it means that he will have to come and rescue us. He will do whatever it takes. And here is this, this is exactly what happened when Jesus died on the cross, the earth trembled. And then we saw uh, this darkness. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet being God's wrath. Jesus took on his father's wrath, the darkness of his wrath, in order to save us. He rode on a cherub and flew. So this is speaking of the swiftness of how he came down. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. So a cherub is actually a royal symbol, by the way. 
He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds dark with water, out of the brightness or his holiness before him. Hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. So this is all just imagery of what David went through when he was fighting uh, with all of his enemies. Then he sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. Now the waters are speaking of the dark gods in Canaan or any power that might have had a hold on him. And any of those who have ever been rescued out of deep waters, it's easier to see the hand of God on your life when you know what God feels like, looks like, acts like when he has rescued you. So this is now going to speak of the triumph over the tomb and the authority of Jesus. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me on the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. So all of this, verses 1 through 19, speak of a prophet of Jesus being rejected. Verse 20, then the Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. So David is pleading his integrity here, even though he sinned greatly, he understands the grace of God. He knows that he doesn't deserve it. He knows that it is unmerited favor. He knows his position though, which is way more important because when you understand God's grace and his forgiveness, you will be in this position as well to be able to say, I am righteous before the Lord. And plus the way he treated Saul too. I wrote that in the end. I was like, let's not forget that, that he really could have just taken the head off of Saul, but he didn't. For all his rules were before me and his statutes I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him and I kept myself from guilt. Of course, we know that Jesus is actually righteous. He never even sinned. He was clean. He kept the ways of the Lord. Um, he never departed from his father. So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. For you save humble people, but the haughty eyes, you bring them down. So he is saying that God will deal with people according to their attitude. And I wanted to do a heart check. How do you see God? What is your attitude? What is it that is being mirrored back onto you from the Lord? Because again, God will deal with people according to their attitude. And this could have been a conversation that Jesus is having with the Father or a picture of Jesus being our mediator. He is like, Lord, Father, I know that this is the way that you treat people. This is the way you're going to appear to people because when they are pure, you're going to be pure. You know, so if you could just imagine that Jesus actually is in fellowship with the Father, I mean, this is his daddy that he's able to talk to about us because he loves us so much. For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. And by my God I can leap over a wall. So David is saying, you gave me supernatural strength. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. Again, David lives his life most of the time by the word of the Lord because that is where his promises are. And it proved true. He experienced it. He knows it. He's got a testimony here. He is a shield for all of those who take refuge in him. So all of those verses from 20 through 30 speak of Jesus reigning as the high priest. Then for who is God? So basically saying there is nobody who can compare but the Lord. And who is a rock except our God, the God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless. So he's saying I was empowered by God. He made my feet like the feet of a deer. He set me secure on the heights. He will give you exactly what you need in the right timing. He trains my hands for war so that arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation. So he's saying you have given me the provision 
because I have been righteous and your right hand supported me. Your gentleness made me great. Now, this is something that I question. I'm like, what makes a person great? If we think about David and his characters, characteristics, if we think about Saul and his characteristics, what is going to make a person great? And look at what makes a person great. It is the gentleness of God. It isn't the lifting up of a person. It is when God is gentle to them. He loves them. He forgives them. He lifts them up. He lifts their head. That's what I view as a gentle God when he forgives you. You know, when you're at your worst, that is the moment where you become great. You gave a wide place for my steps under me and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them and did not turn back till they were consumed. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise and they fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me and those who hated me I destroyed. They cried for help, but there was no one to save. And they cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them, Saul. I beat them as fine as dust before the wind and I cast them out like the mire of the streets. So this is showing Jesus coming as the conquering king, his second coming, when he will come to conquer the earth once and for all. He, uh, he will establish his kingdom for God, which means there will be justice, equity, peace, prosperity. He will rule. Once again, this is going to be a glorious time on the earth. So here we see the prophetic message of the Messiah's reign as Jesus reign. You delivered me from strife with the people. You made me the head of the nations. People whom I have not known served me. Um, but if we look at David's life, David actually had not only... Uh, the kingship, but also some regional power. So if you think about it, um, maybe like United Nations, right? There's, you're, you've got a president of a country and then you've got people who or nations who are ruling as powers in other places, in regional leadership. And so that's basically what David probably had. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives and blessed be my rock. So first he was saying the Lord is my rock. And now because he knows the Lord is his rock, he's like, blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation. Anybody sing that song as a kid? I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Oh, wow. I'm trying to think. Save are my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Okay, stop, can I? <laughs> I just took me back to like when I was six years old. The God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from the man of violence. Man, this is so different from the Psalms we had been reading, those Psalms of lament, right? And here we are seeing the returning of the king, the son of David. For this, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. And the fact that he's saying it among all the nations, this is showing God's desire for everyone to be saved. And sing to your name, great salvation he brings to his king. And shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. So this is speaking of the hereditary monarchy of David and which points to ultimately Jesus. So this is showing that Jesus is going to reign with his father. He is on his way. And I love how David ends here by saying great salvation he brings to his king. He is showing that he didn't have to make himself king. He didn't you know, try to go around and push himself into this place of royalty. He waited on the Lord because he knew he was his king. And he was anointed probably 20 years back, but... He knows that this was going to be his rightful place. And of course, with Jesus being the anointed, not only uh, the prophet, the great prophet, he is uh, the king of kings. He is the great high priest. Those were the people who were anointed. And that's exactly what Jesus fulfills in all things. So I know that was a lot. So we're going to just break it down here once again. Uh, Verses one through six speak of Jesus's death. Verses 7 through 18 speaks of his resurrection. 19 through 27, the exaltation. 24 through 82, his victory. And 43 through 50, reigning um, in his kingdom. So if you want to 
take a screenshot of this or if you get them in the notes, you can take a look back and try to go through this once again. This is a lot for you to maybe go back and meditate on. I know I had um, studied this last year, so there were some notes from last year. I had written a prayer here. Um, so, you know, every time you enter into the word of God, something new pops out. And look, in fact, here, I didn't even go over this. God, he's my Lord, my strength, rock, fortress, deliverer, God, refuge, help, support, rescuer, rewarder, savior, shield, equipper. Wow. God, thank you. Thank you for being all of this to us, not just to David, Lord. You are still this to us today. And so help us to reflect on this. Help us to remember this, to get it deep into our spirit so that when we call upon the Lord, we will know we will be saved. We will know that you will give us exactly what we need when we need strength, when we need safety, when we need protection, when we need to be delivered from something, when we need help with something, when we need to be rescued out of something, Lord, when we need uh, to, when we need a savior if we haven't been saved yet lord i just pray that you will reveal yourself to us in time of need but also before that so we can be ready and prepared thank you for the victory that david was able to have over his enemies because of who you are lord and knowing that we too have complete victory over the enemy help us to focus on the true battle lord help us not to get distracted with petty things so that we are able and ready whenever you call us to step up to step out and to fight the true fight we love you so much we thank you for this time together in jesus name we pray amen heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace we're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer I'm gonna put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came you died and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.